This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo, it's Wednesday. Whoa, that means energy day, okay? Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Richard Walsgrove joins us tonight. He's a professor at uh, UH Law School, William S. Richardson Law School, and we have a bunch of students. Hi, Richard, thanks for coming down. Thanks for having me, Jay. He's a co-host. Yeah. And Got Brent Morioka, uh, who is the transportation guy of Hawaiian Electric. That's not your real title. Let me try to give a real title here. It's... Um, it's General Manager of Electrification of Transportation at Hawaiian Electric. EOT for short, yeah. EOT. Yeah. We'll call you the yeah. EOT. Very good. Okay. And, and we, you know, this is our, like, um, this is like our, 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 visiting, our visiting piece of news, uh, press release news. And after an embargo, this came out, what, yesterday or today? A third, last Thursday, March 29th. Last Thursday? Yeah. Oh, I know. And it's called... Ingrained in my head because that's, that's been the target for the last nine months. Okay. And it's yeah. called, the article anyway, is called Broad Economic Environmental Benefits Described in Electric Electrification of Transportation Roadmap. So, Brennan, tell us about the roadmap. Well, so the Electrification of Transportation Strategic Roadmap was uh, in, in the works for a number of years. Um, it had never really been put to paper, and so PC had requested us to actually file something formally, put down what Hawaiian Electric, uh, you know, thinks its role is in the electrification of transportation, uh, and and what some of the initiatives that we would like to be putting forward. And so, you know, it's a it's a very um, thoughtful, very consuming document. But what I'm what I'm most proud of is it, it's a very collaborative document. Um, you know, it, we had a number of workshops with stakeholders, a meeting, individual meetings with smaller groups, individual groups, really to get their feedback because it needed to be something that our community, our energy and transportation community uh, was, was bought into um, going forward because it's not just something Hawaiian Electric or the utility can do on its own. It really needs a number of partners to be pushing various aspects forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and what was also nice to see was that it was a marriage or, or building relationships of organizations in the energy sector and combining that with organizations in the transportation sector, which doesn't necessarily have an immediate or direct tie, but um, you know, with electrification of transportation, there are a lot of, of agencies, um, transportation industry sectors that really must buy in and understand some of the energy aspects of their business. And so Hawaiian Electric um, and our companies uh, want to play that role of a facilitator, be there to help educate people, be a li liaison or be that trusted advisor that we can help answer questions for people uh, or businesses that want to make the move. Um, which we believe is a necessary move. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that our, our, the EOT roadmap is really meant to do is, uh, is really three things. One is help assist in the state's efforts to achieve 100% RPS. Uh, you know, I, I think without uh, electric for transportation. For, well, just RPS in the, 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 the initial 100% RPS goal. Right. Um, the original 100%. Correct. Um, you know, others have now thrown on this clean transportation initiatives as well which I think is, is very much a part of us getting to that 100% overall RPS. Um, I think without EOT, um, we can still achieve it, but it becomes far harder for us as a community to do. Mm -hmm. With EOT, there's a lot, lot more avenues that we can now take advantage of that wasn't necessarily available to us before, especially with some of the innovative technologies coming on. Um, but also, it, Electrifying our transportation, you know, it's, and it's not just electric vehicles. It's electric buses. It's electric cranes at the at the harbors. It's e <coughs> electric ground service equipment at the at the airports. So it's really transportation industry as a whole. Um, if we can move toward that um, and get off of the dependency on fossil fuels, we end up with a cleaner environment. We have more energy security because we now um, don't need to import and rely on all the the petroleum that has to be come from that comes from someone someplace else, um, we are we kind of control much more of our own destiny, mm -hmm. and then all of that in turn, um, with if we do it right and we partner right and everything kind of falls in place, um, we can see overall savings for all of our customers, not just those who own an electric vehicle, but but all of our uh, utility customers across the board. They would see some form of benefits 
uh, or value by electrification of transportation. So uh, is, what's the status of this uh, roadmap right now? Is it, is it approved and you know, ready to go and actually being implemented or you have to go through some process yet? Well, we just filed it with the PUC uh, on the 29th of March. And so now the, you know, the, the process is still kind of um, you know, undetermined. Uh, they did not ask us to submit it for approval. It was more for information, mm -hmm. but you know, once they read through it, there may be a decision to create an, a docket of its own um, or create, a, uh, you know, have further discussion. And so we're also planning on, on having a meeting in advance um, uh, with the PUC, the State Energy Office, Consumer Advocates Office, uh, just to kind of you know answer whatever questions so that they might have. Broad-based acceptance. Abs numbers. Absolutely. Yeah. So so we do tend to try and be as proactive as we can in trying to uh, answer whatever questions people might have, and so that's our next step. I think I think in a couple of weeks we're meeting with them, and hopefully that's going to be a very fruitful dialogue. You know we've included uh, a number of parties, including uh, those three, along the way um, through the entire development of the roadmap. So. You know, hopefully there were no surprises mm -hmm. um, for them, and we've shared every all of our ideas along the way. So, you know, hopefully it's it's just a matter of moving forward. Uh, we do plan on starting some of the initiatives that we outline in the roadmap um, very soon, uh, and, and so you know we're we're we intend to to have to have a lot more dialogue. We had a lot before, but it's just going to continue and grow. I, I take it that when you when you when you say initiatives, they're incentive programs. To incentivize uh, changing of community and business, uh, you know, conduct, in order to adopt electric vehicles and electrification of transportation more than they might otherwise have done. So, what kind of incentives? What kind of incentive initiatives are we talking about? Sure, and and, and incentives is just one aspect. Oh, good. Right? Um, there there are other programs that we do think are necessary in order to achieve some of the goals that we want including public education and outreach. That, that I think, is going to be probably the key piece to a successful roadmap um, implementation. But in terms of some of the, the, the incentives, um, you know, one of the biggest barriers for some, uh, someone to choose to buy an electric vehicle right now is that upfront cost. You know, right now, electric vehicles are a little bit more expensive just because of the cost of the battery. But as battery prices decrease, uh, and the cost of the cars will come down as well. And people believe in by 2025, you have cost parity. An electric vehicle in the same type of model will cost about the same as a regular gasoline car. Are you going to go for a resumption of state credits on this? So tax credits, so the federal tax credit, which is currently in place, is a big incentive um, that is already out there. Uh, you know, there's talk about you know, whether or not we can uh, incentivize state tax credits. Um, we had some in the past. Can we do some again in the future that would help in, the, in this interim well, until we hit 2025 in cost parity? But also working, Hawaiian Electric, working with some of our car manufacturer um, and dealerships. Um, last year, we were very successful in working with Nissan in offering a $10,000 rebate. So just right off the top of the bat, you get a $10,000 cost reduction oh, yeah, of a Nissan that was Leaf. pretty attractive. To the, to the point where by November, Nissan started running out of Leafs here in Hawaii and they couldn't get enough inventory. So people weren't actually available, uh, able to take full advantage. Yeah, that's but, the kind of program I'm talking yeah, about. So, yeah, so, but we're also working with them right now. So Nissan is, um, until June, 20, June 30th, uh, they're going to be offering a $3,000 rebate on the 2018 LEAF. So it's not the same, it's not the same as the $10,000 that you got last year, but $3,000 is, is still a significant amount when you're you know, trying to make a decision on, on buying a car. Brent, uh, uh, Brennan, I want to I offer Richard the opportunity to ask you a question, just to keep this uh, you know, flowing between us. We only have a minute left, yeah? I'm, I'm excited by the, the roadmap. I think one of the things that really excites me the most is this idea that there's savings for everybody. And what Brendan didn't say is those savings get even bigger if we just incentivize Absolutely. simple behaviors. Biggest, biggest example is if we can get folks to charge these cards in the middle of the day, say you show up at work and you plug your car in at work, then the savings grow, what, what by a factor of two or something like two that? Two or three in, in certain aspects, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what do you think is the key to getting that di sort of driving on sunshine uh, concept going? The first one is obviously providing the infrastructure. So, you know, we've, we've already started meeting with developers um, business owners, employers, trying to uh, explain the benefits of workplace charging for their employees as an employee benefit, but also as a, as a greater participation in uh, trying to provide a cleaner environment, cost savings in the future. And so, you know, that's the kind of conversation in the public education aspect that I talked about that needs to continue. 
um, that we'll be doing in the interim, and hopefully we'll, we'll see further support and partnership with many of our other stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate we it, Jay. Anytime, continue man. continue down the road with you. We want to hear more about it as it rolls out. Absolutely. Aloha. Thank we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back after this break, and we're going to talk to Richard's friends, lots of them. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Hello everyone, Ted Ralston here, a host of our Think Tech show, Where the Drone Leads, where we talk weekly at uh, Thursdays noon, by the way, on subjects related to the emer emerging technology and business of drones, as they might apply here in Hawaii. Uh, issues involving commerce and education, legislation, uh, technology, public safety, all the things that you might want to hear about. Uh, we talk about them with uh, local experts and people from across the country. So join us at uh, noon on every Thursday, and we'll have a new subject, and we'll have uh, new faces to talk about this most interesting subject area. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy and think tech on Wednesday. It's our flagship energy show. Richard Walsgrove, Professor Richard Walsgrove, the William S. Richardson School of Law, is my co-host, and he has invited some of his students down. We're going to talk to them now. So, Richard, can you please introduce them, and let's talk about the scope of this discussion to follow. I, I would love to, and thanks for allowing us to come in today, Jay. So we have uh, Magdalena. <clears throat> she's been, uh, she's a, actually a postgraduate student at the law school. She's been working on uh, what's called a, a law thesis, right? So it's sort of like a PhD thesis, but in the law. Okay. Uh, and as part of that work, she gets to take some courses. So she's in our, in our clean energy law and policy course. Uh, we have Chase. Chase is a second year law student. He's, uh, he's actually been working on energy issues for a long time, even before law school. And so Chase is also in the clean energy law and policy course, and they're working on uh, projects this semester related to real energy issues here in Hawaii, and I'm excited to have them talk about it. So maybe we'll start with Chase. Sure Chase, thing. you want to tell us a little bit about your project? Yeah, so uh, I've been studying a recent uh, PPA, which is a power purchase agreement uh, application for a, um, it's a solar plus storage project on Molokai, and it is going to be uh, actually a, a quite large project um, contributing about 45 percent uh, of the towards Molokai's 100 uh, percent renewable uh, portfolio standard goal um, and so this this project it's uh, known as a half half, half moon ventures um, but they're going to be it's a real project yes this is actually happening I don't know if it's been fully vetted and accepted but it's it's going there's a company that... called half moon doing a project Yes, sir. Is this and coincidence or what? Well, it's going <laughs> through the process. We'll see. Okay, all right. Um, but it, it, so it's it's uh, now reached the PUC, um, and so it's being reviewed. Um, but it's it's quite a large project, and so I'm just examining kind of the various ways it's uh, uh, it's going to benefit the community, uh, both on the island and in Hawaii as a whole. It's like a reality show. 
you got a real project, then you got a law school project tracking on the real project. <laughs> <laughs> it's really very close. You know? It's awesome. It's You're right really... inside the deal, eh? Absolutely. <laughs> It's, it's a fantastic way to yeah. learn. We've done it's... two shows on that project, so oh, really? it might okay. help you in your research to watch the two shows. Definitely. <laughs> I'll check it out. Okay, is that what you wanted to bring out? Uh, you... well, Chase, do you want to describe a little bit about the time you spent on Molokai and the perspectives that you've sort of learned from the community? I, I think uh, sure Jay should hear. Yeah, so um, I had the, the privilege of, of going over um, and attending a community meeting um, where we had some of the uh, project developers, uh, actually the, the main project developer, Mike, Mike Hastings. Um, and so uh, we had representatives from MECO as well um, and a number of community members. Um, and so it was a really cool experience. Uh, it was a great opportunity for the community to, to learn about the project um, and to raise some of their uh, questions um, and hopes um, and perhaps concerns about the project. Um, so, so it's really, it, it's well on the way, but there are still things that are being worked out. Um, and so that community engagement, I think, is going to be really yeah. key. So what's your advice to Hastings? What's your statement of concern to him? What should he be looking at? Be his lawyer for a minute. Listen to the community. That's, that's the number one. <laughs> it didn't take too long to get an answer on that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it, that's, that's the key here in Hawaii. It's, you know, we, we live in an island. It's a small place. Uh, everyone knows everyone. Every decision, development, it impacts everything else. Um, so, so it's really key to kind of get that wide. Great, very yeah. interesting project. Mm -hmm. Okay, Richard. Magdalena has an equally interesting project and one that when she mentioned it to me, my ears really perked up. Um, she's looking at whether or not real estate investment trusts could be a good vehicle for renewable energy investment. Oh, Did you wow. Want to tell us what you know about that, Magdalena? Yeah, so I'm researching um, the topic and I believe that it would be a good vehicle to uh, expand the um, sector to provide investors or to allow uh, investors and especially on the uh, local ground where we are so um, secluded yeah. <laughs> and that's why we need local people uh, with even small investors to to bring some money into. <laughs> okay, why, why a real estate investment trust? Why not an LLC? Uh, because it's an interesting entity that, that was created in 1960 to, uh, to expand the, um, to small investors. That was the main idea, but also there are some interesting tax breaks mm -hmm. that if the if REIT uh, meet meet certain requirements under internal internal revenue uh, code, then they are not taxed on ninety percent of their income. Mm. So what's also interesting is that because of the broad broad portfolio of the investments, uh, the possibility of lowering the cost of the renewable energy projects is big if we're thinking about real estate investment trusts. The only problem is the definition of real property. So to actually make it happen and allow those REITs to benefit um, from the full potential of that entity, we would have to seek some guidance from internal revenue service mm. and expand that definition. Mm. Like a, 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 an opinion or something, a revenue ruling. Uh, are you looking for mm -hmm. a, a change in the statute somewhere, federal or state? Not necessarily. The, mm. we, we don't need the change in the internal revenue code, only the opinion. So, so we might be able to to move some. So if I tell you that for the past couple of years, maybe more, there have been bills in the Hawaii State Legislature mm -hmm. that would attempt to, to make REITs yes. taxable here as mm -hmm. if they were corporations or LLCs, mm -hmm. well, corporations, um, does that change your conclusion? It doesn't change my conclusion because I do not believe that those bills will succeed. Because what? 
I do not believe that those bills will succeed. Like, well, they haven't yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there are people who fight tooth and nail to stop them, I might add. <laughs> as we see, there are um, as many as 42 or even more REITs here in Hawaii that invest in all sorts of real estate, including our shopping malls and healthcare centers and, uh, and other facilities and doing lots for the local economy. So hopefully we'll allow them to stay benefit from the um, very interesting, very interesting idea. Very and even expand them to renewable energy. Yeah, projects. sure. Uh, gee, that could be a very interesting vehicle to increase the amount of investment locally and mm -hmm. also offshore to our projects. What are interesting. Was that your idea? Unfortunately not. Or maybe yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, why don't you summarize this part and then we go to the next. This is certainly, there's an interesting parallel here if you think about it. I, I know the community on Molokai has expressed an interest in actually owning projects like the Half Moon Ventures project. Perhaps they mm -hmm. need a real estate investment trust that allows these small investments to, to happen. So these guys are working on cutting edge issues and I'm, I'm really excited to read the papers that come out of it and I'll get a little <laughs> smarter at the end of the semester. No pressure. <laughs> I'm sure Amelia Vanderhoek is watching this show from Molokai. She's the group, uh, Sustainable Molika, yeah. Okay, we're going to take a, a break now. Thank you both. Thank you, Chase. Thank Ch you. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to talk to two more of your friends, Richard. Wonderful. Short break right now. You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come banging on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You could talk to God, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. <laughs> We're back. We're live. We've had another break. We're back with Richard Walsgrove, professor, I guess, um, mostly in, in energy or in everything at uh, UH uh, Law School. We end up in everything, but uh, energy law is what gets me excited. Well, I, let me say that energy touches everything anyway, Absolutely. doesn't it? You can't study it in a vacuum, ever. Yeah. Uh, so, Richard, would you introduce your next two friends? I would love to. Round two. So, uh, today we have uh, Tara. She's here, she's working on a project that I think is fascinating related to her home state, Virginia, and thinking about how we might import renewable energy policies from places like Hawaii to places like Virginia, which have you know, a, a whole host of differences. Uh, and we have uh, Kevin. Kevin's looking at an equally interesting project. He's looking at Department of Hawaiian Homelands and how solar development might happen uh, in conjunction with DHHL, particularly concepts like community solar. Ah, yeah. Who wants to go first? Uh, I think I'll go first. Okay. Sure. <laughs> so um, I like that. <laughs> building someone off what was just said in the earlier segment, um, you know, community involvement and community investment in renewable energy and in Hawaii's goals of meeting our renewable energy standards, uh, I think is going to be an important aspect moving forward. Uh, so DHHL, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, is uniquely situated in that they have uh, a large amount of land that is potentially available for use for uh, project sites such as the proposed Kalaiiloa solar uh, project. So actually just recently, uh, the bidding period, which was a 21-day period, closed on March 30th uh, for a, a proposal uh, to build a solar plant near the Kalaiiloa airport. Um, my project is looking somewhat at uh, community involvement and how we can bring community members through, through some sort of investment plan 
uh, into the scope of these projects rather than just keeping them uh, in the hands of a renewable energy company or uh, any other entity that Why? may pursue. Why? Isn't it easier to get money somewhere else? Well, specifically what I'm looking at are the benefits to the recipients of Department of Hawaiian Homelands funds. Um, whether it would be more beneficial to lease the land, which is the proposal now, or to actually be involved in the project and have a power purchase agreement in which members receive a return based on their share, uh, their percentage of shares. So one part of the proposal is to have a 25-year buyback plan where uh, the infrastructure would be built by whatever entity wins the bid. And uh, in 25 years, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands could buy back that, that parcel uh, fully operational. So I think that potentially that may be a good option to pursue with maybe a shorter time frame for the buyback period. But uh, again, just benefiting the community and, and in particular Hawaiians and people that uh, DHHL funds are supposed to benefit. So um, you're a law student. You're creating this plan. There's lots of wrinkles to it. There's legal wrinkles. There's policy. There's, you know, gosh, there's half a dozen areas of law. Um, how do you how do you present? Do you present orally? Do you go in front of uh, the class, in front of Professor Walsgrove here, and tell him, or do you write him a big paper? And well, if you write him a big paper, do you publish a paper? And if you publish a paper, where? And where can I see it? <laughs> so that was a lot of questions. I think the class has heard me. It's called uh, a multiple compound <laughs> question. Yes, the class hears me present every day. We have a two and a half hour class uh, once a week, so we have a lot of discussion time during that class. And um, I I don't exactly intend on. Uh, publishing my research or, or whatever paper I do write out of this. Um, it was more just an examination. I may bring it to the attention of certain people that are involved in these projects. Um, I, I have in the past submitted testimony to the PUC and, and different legislative matters. Uh, perhaps portions of this could be used towards that. Um, but, but no concrete plans. Yeah, what strikes me uh, that's why I asked you the question about why not you know, use another source of capital. Is if, if you have people, local people, people right there on the ground investing, you have buy-in automatically. You have investment and support automatically. You also have the possibility of return. I mean, it, it just makes for a much more robust, nourishing experience for the whole community uh, than trying to get it from Wall Street. Sorry, that's how I feel. Right, and I, I mean, I agree with that. Um, you know, one thing that was interesting, I, I was looking at the budget for DHHL and their operating budget for fiscal year 2018, uh, one million, for almost $1.5 million towards electricity alone in their operating costs. Um, so potentially buy-ins that could go towards offsetting those costs. Um, I, you know, investors from uh, the island locally are, are great and I think the community can be involved as well. So many great possibilities. Okay, next one. You know, what, what I haven't told them yet is there's actually an energy paper competition. Papers do right around the end of the semester. And so you may actually see some of these, these papers in print. Okay, I want to see that. You know, we, could, we could follow up with that, don't you think? I think we could. So next we have Tara. You want to tell us a little about your ideas about uh, renewable energy in Virginia? Yes. Okay, so my home state is Virginia. And um, I really love Hawaii and learning about um, the, the environmental laws that are here. And I would like to try to import those to Virginia because currently Virginia doesn't even have um, an RPS goal that uh, they have voluntary RPS goal so I think and they don't have any incentives uh, for solar so I think that um, being able to lobby and get these um, laws on the books in Virginia would be beneficial especially from the region that I come from which just so happens to be um, the lowest in, uh, below the poverty rate in Virginia so if we could um, tell them how it'll be benefiting them, then um, lowering energy rates and also with clean energy, I think that would be a great thing to take to Virginia. Yeah. What about this appeals to you, Richard? Well, I think one of the interesting facets to Tara's Richard's idea... Richard's been out of the legislature as much as any human being alive person can kind of think. <laughs> What's interesting about this is that I think Tara has a really good understanding of the renewable energy land policy landscape here in Hawaii, but she also has a really good understanding of how different the policy landscape is in Virginia. And so she's giving real strategic thought to wh which policies might work. How do you frame those policies? I think some of the you know her ideas about cost as the sort of the driver, as opposed to here we talk about emissions reductions lots of times. Um, the, the sort of the whole package she brings to this 
I couldn't write this paper. There's no way. I just don't know enough about what's happening on the ground in Virginia. Do you have any ideas about sort of sequencing? What do you think is the most important policy to get the ball rolling in Virginia? I think um, for, for the rest of Virginia, because most of Virginia is actually red, even though the state turned blue a couple of years ago. So how I would frame it is um, the cost reduction in electricity. So I think first thing that would need to be there would be tax incentives, I think. So people can actually start affording it. Otherwise, they're not going to get it. And our state's not going to have clean energy, and it'll be all for waste. So having an RPS goal, but no one being able to afford it um, or buying in for that reason, then the RPS would be. How do you think that the, the red counties or the red areas of Virginia would respond to the idea of a tax incentive? I think definitely. Uh, I think it would be a very positive thing. Um, so where I'm from is, is the, the red part. And um, uh, AEP right now has a monopoly just in that specific area um, that I'm from in my region. And electricity costs are extremely high, even during the winter, uh, because whether uh, people in the red buy into climate change or not, they would still buy into reducing their electric bills because whether they believe climate change is real or not, we're in spring and it's snowing a lot. So they're still having winter electric bills that they're not used to, and those are relatively high. So the study is to uh, figure out how to reach people, mm -hmm. how to appeal to them on projects, and I suppose, again, how to change their, their conduct as a group. Yes. And what we can learn from other states is useful here. I, I, I always find that when you come to the legislature, mostly the policy the people, um, you know, and you tell them this is the way it works in another state, another state, another state, uh, that's very persuasive uh, because people in Hawaii always want to know, they always want to compete and compare with things elsewhere. So this, this would be persuasive. I think them. there's also an issue there with Virginia being red instead of telling them that this state comes from a very progressive state, right, um, or a very liberal state. It's going to be, well, these, this is going to benefit you, and this is how. Yeah. We're really after going, going to take both of the parties, putting them together, and coming hey, to Hey, Richard, what issues. have we learned today? Uh, the students in my class are much smarter than we are, and so if we're talking about the energy workforce of the future, we're in pretty good hands. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you for coming down, Richard, and, and thank you, uh, Tara, and thank you, Kevin, and thank you, you guys, from before. Um, and I want to do it again. I hope we can do it again, okay? Come down and talk to us about how these projects unfold, especially after you write it down. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Richard Walsgrove and then uh, Kevin and Tara, thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks, thanks for having us. Aloha.